what seems typical for me as pastor here at River Church, this, this particular week between Christmas and leading up to the new year is, a, is often a time of reflection and of observation, looking back and looking forward, and, and this week has been no different. I, I thought a lot about the community of faith that God has brought together here at River Church. And when I think about you, I think about how God has has made himself known through you and to you, not just over the last year, but but January, end of January, we'll be celebrating nine years of ministry. We're going into our 10th year uh, in, in, in 2020, will be 10 years of ministry. And to see where we've come from, from starting out as a small little prayer group in a living room up on Big Ridge back in 2009, to where we're at today, we're not massive, we're not mega, we're not mega anything, but one thing that I can look and I can see as I look across the room is a great level of depth and maturity. And people who are truly hungry for the real expression of faith, looking for a real expression of what it looks like to be part of the church that Jesus has established. It brings me great pleasure to stand here in front of you every Sunday and to, and to lead you into a place of, as, as disciples who make disciples. A week ago, we were talking about Christmas, and we talked about the fact that Jesus came and that his coming was, was for everyone, that no one was excluded. I challenged you last Sunday to prayerfully consider how you could welcome people around your table this Christmas into your family, into your home, into your, your celebrations. And a really cool thing happened after church last Sunday. A couple of you came up to me and said, hey, what would you think about us offering a, a, a Christmas dinner here on, on Christmas night for anyone that maybe doesn't have a place to go. And so um, I said, that's fine. I, we couldn't be here. We already had made family plans. But uh, we opened up the, the, the church and the coffee shop on Christmas night. And through our evening, being with family, I was texting and getting texts back and forth and, and found out there were about 35 people that came here for, for dinner. And, and some of those were people who, weren't, who, who didn't have a place to go. Some of them were you sitting here in the room this morning. And um, I was standing there with my phone and I'm reading the text off to, to my family. I was like, listen to this, listen to this. And Josie was standing beside me. And she turns and she looks at me and she said, well, Dad, you've talked to us about being disciples who make disciples. And uh, I think that's happening right now, don't you? And I said, it sure is. Because what a huge thing. I mean, you know, in most churches, it's people expect, and, and rightfully so, the pastor to be at everything that happens with the church. But, but this happened on such short notice, and it wasn't possible for us to be here. But it was such a cool thing to be able to hear that you, you didn't wait on me. You weren't depending on me to be here to, to get everybody together. And come on, we can do this. You did it on your own. What a huge sense of, of, of reward and, and, and almost fatherly pride. And I think that God's okay with me having that, um, to, to look around and say, wow, God, look at what you've done. Look at, look at what you've grown here. And I think that it's a beautiful expression of what the church should look like. So I guess what I'm saying to you this morning at the outset is I'm proud of you. I'm, 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 I'm honored to be, to be considered among you, to, to lead you. I'm so thankful for the community of faith that God has built here. And yet there's a part of me that's sad, that's sad for a lot of Christians around the world. Many Christians who spend their entire life believing in God, but they never really attempt to, to, to go deeper in their relationship with Him. To them, it's just a surface level sort of exercise of faith. Their expression of faith, their, belief, their level of belief, it doesn't go very deep. It's, it's rather shallow. They, they stand on the sidelines as spectators and they hear about God doing things around them or in other places or in other people's lives. But they themselves never experience the thrill, the adventure, the excitement, the, the joy that comes from God using them, God equipping them, God bringing them to a deeper place. My heart breaks for Christians who have that kind of faith walk. And, and while I have huge regard and high hopes for you sitting here, the truth is that some of you sitting here in this room this morning are at that place. Some of you have yet to go in deep. For some of you, your faith walk is still very shallow. But for all of you, I would do a huge disservice to you to stand here in front of you this morning and somehow, somehow communicate to you that we've arrived, that we've met, that we've gotten to that place, that, that we're good. Everybody just come on and gather in. We're good and we can just hold steady. We can just kind of maintain until Jesus comes back. 
If I, were to, if I were to challenge you just to stand still and just hold on until he comes back, I would be selling you short because there's still more for us to experience. There's still deeper places for us to go in our relationship with the Lord. As an old year ends and a new year begins, we stand at a, at a critical crossroads to, to say, where are we going to go? What is this next year going to, to look like for, for me, for us as a body, for you personally? What, what, what is it, what's, what's going to happen in 2019? And my prayer is that God would take us deeper and deeper and deeper still. That he would make us hungry for him, for his kingdom. That we, would, that we would know what we are to be, what he has called us to be, which is disciples who make disciples. And that we would settle for nothing less than all of him that we could, could possibly contain in this upcoming year. Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, in the Beatitudes, he says in Matthew chapter 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. What a huge promise that he gives to us. Unfortunately, many Christians will never hunger and thirst for righteousness because we or they have been, have been tra trained to feast on the junk food that, that shallow Christianity or the junk food that the world has to offer. And it's not possible to truly hunger for Jesus if our souls, if our lives are currently satisfied with less than what he has intended for us to have. How can you be hungry for something that you've never really eaten. I don't know about you, but when I started eating sugar, especially during the holidays, my family made peanut butter balls during the Christmas week. And man, if I had one, I had 500. Because you eat one and you're like, mm, oh, that was, that was good. I think I'm going to go back and have another. And by, the time, by the time the day is over, you go and you look, who ate all the peanut butter balls? And then you start kind of looking down and you realize, oh, I think I know who did. Pillsbury or Doughboy is standing over here with more than one peanut butter ball. Uh, that he's digested. You, you get an appetite for, 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 the, for those things that you eat the most of. And you get hungry for those things. So the question is, are we truly hungry for Jesus, for, for righteousness? The influence of our culture is strong and it feeds us so much spiritual junk. We become, and in, 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 in our society, we are becoming increasingly divided and broken. Our country is drowning in the mire of political division right now. Racial tensions, physical violence, and selfish ambition. You see it all around us. We see sexual confusion and spiritual disorientation in our culture. This is all junk food. This is all the diet, the, the, the food that's set before us. And we have a choice of whether or not we're going to eat from that or we're going we're gonna to hunger for righteousness. In the West, we have more money, more mobility, and more life liberties than we've ever had. Yet our culture seems to be losing ground in so many ways. And the condition of our culture can also be seen in the condition of the American church. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes to the, to, to the Corinthian followers of Christ. And he says to them, look, the world is going to act like the world. They're going to do worldly things. So don't get, don't get all weirded out when, when sinners sin, because that's what happens. But we have, a, we have a responsibility to make a choice to live differently. In the same letter, he, he says, while you're expecting the world is going to be worldly, be on your guard when, when those things begin to creep in and the church begins to act like the world. In 1 Corinthians, there's a lot of Paul's instructions to say, all right, this is how they do it, but this is how you should do it. The church in America has grown more impotent and powerless as it's gone on. Jesus talks about salt losing its saltiness in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5.13. And I think in a large part the church has lost its saltiness. There are Christians that are just kind of walking around and we are cultural Christians, surface level Christians. We traded holiness for the pursuit of relevance. Self-professing Christians are living lives that look no different from the lives of of their non-Christian friends and neighbors and co-workers, can I ask you very honestly this morning, if you were to put your life next to the life of your non-believing friend, how much different would it look? Can people look at you and say, ah, there's something distinctively different about them than everyone else? 
Millions of self-professed Christians rarely pray, rarely read their Bibles, rarely give of their resources. They rarely serve the poor. They rarely share their faith with the lost. And what's worse is that many of them don't seem to care or even notice. And while that may not necessarily be the case of, of what we hope to be the majority here at River Church, I still believe that there is a deeper place that the Holy Spirit is calling us so that we don't gravitate in that direction, but we go deeper, that we go closer, that we come to a more intimate place with Jesus, that we become distinctively more and more different in a culture that is going one way, that we choose to be followers of Christ that swim upstream. We have to acknowledge that there is more of God for us to experience, that there are deeper places for us to go. That we are where we need to be and we have to refuse to settle for anything less, for the status quo. We have to position ourselves ready for God to do amazing through us, in us, and around us. And now, as we stand between one, between an old year and a new year, this is the best of times for us to say, you know what? Let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. Throughout church history, you look at great revivals, great awakenings, great movements of the Holy Spirit. When the church was fully on mission, experiencing powerful demonstrations of the Holy Spirit, those times occurred with, with a significant amount of, of sacrificial consecration and spiritual preparation. You will find before every great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, every great move within church history, you will find a season, a group of committed followers of Christ who, who knew what it was to sacrificially pray and to fast. Prayer and fasting is what moves us into deeper places in our relationship with God. I want to make a bold statement to you this morning, and it's on your sermon guide, and I want you to hear this because I believe it so strongly. Prayer and fasting are not only a way, but the way for the American church to truly experience the fullness of what God wants to do in us and through us. You look to look around the world and see in parts of the world where the church is flourishing. Where, where people, where there is, where there are masses that are coming to Jesus on, on, a, on a daily basis. One thing that you will find there that you will not find here present in the American church is a lifestyle of communal sacrificial prayer and fasting together. It is a must-have ingredient in a recipe for revival. And so that's what I want to talk to you for a few minutes about this morning. Is a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. Let's, let's make, unpack the definition of fasting. What's fasting? Simply stated, fasting is refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. Refraining from food for a spiritual purpose. Don't turn me off. I know some of you are like, oh, man, this is all things for us to be listening to this morning. Giving up food. Hang in here with me. It's letting go of something in the physical realm to take hold of new things in a spiritual realm. Now, for honest, most of us see fasting as a burden. It's not something that we like to talk about. We don't see it as a blessing. Because fasting stands in bold opposition to everything that we are conditioned to naturally do day in and day out. Our lives revolve, for the most part, revolve around the meal table. We meet at meals. We talk at meals. We get together with other people for dinner. And in my house, the most common question that is asked is, what's for dinner? What are we having for lunch? What's for breakfast? What are we eating tomorrow? What are we... That's no different than a lot of people because so much of what we do revolves around eating. And so many Christians don't understand the significance and the importance of fasting. And not only do we not understand, but many of us don't want to understand because it speaks of sacrifice, of giving up. But I want you to understand something. Fasting is a big deal to God. It's a big deal to God. It is explicitly mentioned in Scripture over 70 times, the discipline of fasting. It is implied even more times. In the Old Testament, we see several examples of followers, of faithful followers of God who submitted themselves through prayer and fasting to God's will and His plan. You find Moses who fasted 40 days before receiving the, the law of God. All these are on the screen so you can pull these in. You, you find David who fasted for seven days as he prayed for his sick son. Ezra fasted as he mourned 
for the sin of his people. And Esther, she fasted for the safety of her people. Daniel fasted for 21 days for clarity and for revelation and direction. That's the Old Testament. You go over to the New Testament and you see other references. Paul fasted after his radical conversion experience, his encounter with Jesus. Church leaders in Antioch fasted before sending out missionaries. And the believers of churches in Galatia, they prayed and they fasted as they prepared to appoint new leaders. And then Jesus himself fasted for 40 days before he officially began his ministry. In fact, as he preaches the Sermon on the Mount, he, he, he makes a pretty bold statement. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, he says, When you do fast, don't look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they're fasting. But I tell you that they receive the reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head, wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to our Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Listen, Jesus expected that we would fast because he said not if you fast but when you fast it wasn't something that we might do it's something that we should do so we're called it's part of the life of discipleship it's what it's an expectation of God that we would live a life of prayer and fasting but if we're going to talk about prayer and fasting, we have to be honest and recognize that there are barriers and there are breakthroughs that we will undoubtedly experience as we step into seasons of prayer and fasting. I want to take a few minutes and talk about a couple of the barriers that you will likely encounter as we talk and walk through this whole idea of fasting. The first barrier that we'll encounter is the barrier of self-sufficiency. We're trained as, a, as children to grow up to be self-sufficient. We talk about being independent and being able to take care of ourselves, and that's a good thing. We want our kids to, to be independent, to be self-sufficient to a certain degree. But as it relates to our spiritual walk, when it comes to our relationship with God, there is no room for self-sufficiency. God wants us to be fully dependent upon Him, not upon ourselves, not on our own strength. But our human nature will fight hard within us time and time again to rely upon our own strength or even the strength and the provision and the power that comes and the protection that comes in our relationships with other people. I want to tell you that this is something that I'm dealing with real time in my own life I'm, as, I'm, as we're finishing up the reading of, of Isaiah at the end of the year. One of the things that I hear God saying to his people over and over and over is that he was frustrating with them because they chose to rely on their own strength or to rely on other nations before, before relying on him. Isaiah chapter 31 verse 1 says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and who depend on horses. They trust in the abundance of chariots and the large number of horsemen. They don't look to the Holy One of Israel and they don't seek the Lord's help. I struggle sometimes to go to Him first. I struggle sometimes with the big issues that are in front of me to, 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 to rather, than, rather than go to Him first and say, all right, here's the big thing that's in front of me now. I start figuring out how I'm going to fix this. How am I going to work this? How am I going to manipulate this? What am I going to do to get around this this obstacle that's in my in my path right now. When God is saying to me, hey, I put that, I've allowed that to be in front of you for a reason because I want you to ask me for help. I want to move those obstacles that are in your life. I want to show up. I want to be the one that you're dependent upon. And so very well may be that in your own life right now, you're facing something that you can't quite figure out how to get around. Maybe he's allowed that thing to be there to get you off of your self-sufficiency and get you into a place where you are wholly dependent on God. And that's what fasting forces. It forces us to admit that we are not self-sufficient. It reminds us that every fiber of our being needs God. We must be dependent upon him, but self-sufficiency will be a barrier that we will undoubtedly encounter. The second barrier that we will face is self-gratification. Our culture, the world around us, there's a constant pursuit of self-gratification that is all around us, and it can be a barrier to prayer and fasting. Society tells us that we can have and should have whatever we want, when we want it, and how we want it. If you're like me, you get something in your mind that you think, man, I, 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 I need this. 
Isn't it amazing the things that you need today that you didn't need 10 years ago? Here's one of them, right? I need a cell phone. I've got to have a cell phone. Well, of course you do, because that's really your only way of connecting with people. But 15 years ago, 10 years ago, did you have to have a cell phone? I think back when Christy and I first got married, we didn't have, she, she, had, she had a car phone. She had a little, the, the, a little it was a, the satchel thing that you carry around and you put in your car, right? Had the curly antenna on top. It wasn't until after we got married that I got, I got my first cell phone. The razor, the sprint razor, the flip. I thought, man, I was like high roll, and I got the, the sleek, slim line cell phone. Now it's archaic, right? Truth is that the phone that I have is archaic right now. But we, we think there are things that we need because culture, society tells us you've got to have that. And most of us will figure out a way to get what we think that we need. This is, this is the self-gratification that drives us. And we have to be careful, a, a guard against self-gratification. But fasting, fasting hits that dead on. You see, self-gratification is challenged by self-denial. And that's what, what fasting challenges. It challenges us to, be, to deny ourselves. Jesus says in Mark chapter 8, 34, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So, being able to... Push back the plate, being able to say, I'm not going to, I don't need that right now. Is what fasting gives us an opportunity, creates an environment for us to be able to experience self-denial. The third barrier that we'll encounter is undisciplined living. You know, discipline breeds discipline. And a lack of discipline tends to lead to less and less discipline. For many, the failure to step into a life of prayer and fasting is not for lack of desire. You could sit here and hear this message this morning and you say, well, yeah, I want to. I want to be a person of prayer and I want to be a person of fasting. But it's not that you don't have the desire, it's that you don't have the discipline. The willingness to say, I'm going to tell myself no and I'm going to accept my answer as no. None of us like to be told no. Whether we're a kid or a grown-up, we don't like that word. It is a strong, full sentence, and we hate it with everything that is in us. And discipline requires, means that at some point, in some way, in some place, we're going to tell ourselves, no, not now. No, I'm not going to eat. No, I'm not going to watch TV. I'm going to go pray. No, I'm going to, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to study the word. I'm going to, I'm going to talk to the Lord. Undisciplined living will be a barrier that you will encounter as you set out to embark on, on a life of prayer and fasting. The fourth barrier that you'll encounter is a lack of vision. A lack of biblical vision hinders us from a life of prayer and fasting because we cannot see and believe that there is more for us to experience. Some of you may be sitting here this morning and think, well, I'm, I'm kind of content with but how my, my relationship with the Lord is, I mean, I come to church, right? And, and, and I, I mean, I listen to Christian radio. It's okay. I mean, I, I, I know how to do the Christian thing. But what that says to me is that if, if you're content there, then you, you have a lack of vision for your life. Because there is always more. There are always deeper and deeper still places that he wants to take us. And if we don't have vision for where he wants to take us, and we don't have vision for the deep places that we can that we can live, then we will not experience the fullness of the abundant life that Jesus has purposed for us to live. And so a lack of vision hinders us from experiencing the, the power that comes in prayer and fasting. So those are barriers. But let's talk about some breakthroughs. This is the good side. This is the good news. What can we what can we look to experience in a life of prayer and fasting? One of the one of the, the most powerful things is a deeper relationship or friendship with God. The ultimate goal of any spiritual discipline, the ultimate goal is to strengthen our relationship with the Father. We have to understand that God is not a means to an end for us. He is not a source of getting everything that we're trying to figure out in life figured out. He is the end. He is the answer. He is the, he is the ultimate. He is our, our end goal. And his rela our relationship with him should be the most important relationship that we're in pursuit of. 
As followers of Jesus, we are to pursue God passionately, not because of what He can do or how He's done for us, but because He is God. He is wonderful. He is good. He is loving. He is graceful. He is merciful. We don't fast to get God to do something for us, but because we want to remove anything that may hinder us and our relationship with Him. Fasting is more about changing us than it is about changing God's mind. Or even changing our circumstances. Another breakthrough that we can experience is a renewed hunger for heavenly things. Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 27, Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God, because God the Father has set His seal of approval on Him. Biblical fasting has a way of not only loosening our grip on the world, but also loosening the world's grip on us. It causes us to hunger for, for things that the world can't give us. It causes us to, to taste and to truly see that He is good and to experience the sweet fruit of relationship with Him. And when we have experienced that, we find that everything else pales in comparison. With empty stomachs, we become more aware of the emptiness in our souls and we purpose ourselves to fill our hearts and our souls with the things that God offers. It's here in this place that He awakens us a true hunger for Him. We begin to crave eternal things, not things of this world. The third breakthrough that comes in the place of prayer and fasting is clarity in prayer. Our prayers are often answered as a result of fasting, and sometimes our prayers change as a result of prayer and fasting. We can set out praying and asking God for one thing, but when we walk into a season of prayer and fasting, He begins to change our perspective. And, and there's been many times I've started out praying for one thing, and as, I, as, as time has gone on, my prayers have changed, and I realize, oh, this is what I'm to be praying for. And that's what ends up happening. He provides clarity for us. In Daniel chapter 10, Daniel answers, uh, receives an answer to prayer. After 21 days of seeking God for clarity and revelation. I love what Isaiah 58 says. Because he speaks to the levels of refreshment and the clarity that comes with prayer and fasting. Let's read this together. Isaiah 58 verse 6. Isn't this the fast that I choose to break the band chains of wickedness to untie the ropes? of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to tear off every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see him, and not ignore your own flesh and blood? Then your light will appear like the dawn, and your recovery will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you, and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. At that time, when you call, the Lord will answer you. When you cry out, he will say, Here I am. If you get rid of the yoke among you, the finger pointing and the malicious speaking, that's the kind of life that he invites us to as we step into a season, to a time of prayer and fasting. We have clarity. We see things differently. We live differently. We hear him differently. So clarity in prayer. The fourth breakthrough, one of many, four of many breakthroughs, I can tell you, that we can experience is freedom from demonic strongholds. The word tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But that we are in spiritual warfare, that there is a, a, a force that is out there, a force of evil and wickedness personified in, in the being of Satan and his demons. And they work against us. And we don't talk a lot about that. And we don't like to hear a lot about that. Because it's, to some people they say, well, it's scary. It's not it's hard to understand. And we like to talk more about the good things. But the reality is, is that we have an enemy of our soul who wants to work against us. And so we are engaged consistently in times and in seasons of spiritual warfare. In Mark chapter 9, verse 9, you see a young man, a little boy, who is being tormented by a demon. And it causes him to, be, to go into seizures and, and to have all these things happen to him. And the disciples try to cast this demon out and they can't. And Jesus arrives on the scene and the father says to him, Master, would you please heal my son? And I love this. This is one of my favorite stories because Jesus asked him this powerful question. Do you believe? And the father says, I believe, but help my unbelief. I, I, I trust, but I, there's a part of me that doesn't trust. And, and, and he casts the demon out. And so the question is, well, why were you able to do it? And why were your disciples not able to? And Jesus' response to them 
to everyone there is that sometimes we encounter things that cannot happen except through prayer and fasting. You see, fasting brings freedom from demonic strongholds and attacks in our lives because it, 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 fasting brings us into a place of deeper fellowship with the Father before entering into battle that we know His heart, that we hear His voice. The Holy Spirit helps us to, to, to get clarity as to what it is that we're specifically fighting against and how to fight against those demonic forces. It's a foolish thing to engage in spiritual warfare without having clarity from the Holy Spirit. And so prayer and fasting <laughs> makes that available to us. So we've talked about the boundary, the, the barriers. We've talked about the breakthroughs. We've talked about the importance and the need for living a life of prayer and fasting. But how does this apply to our lives? If we want the breakthroughs, we have to take action. We have to step in that direction. So this morning, as your pastor, I'm calling River Church to a season of prayer and fasting. In years past, I've stood here in front of you and I've said, well, you know, if, if you want to, then you can. And, and, and it would really be a good idea. But I feel so strong as we step into a new year that the Holy Spirit is challenging me to challenge you to follow me as I follow Christ into a season of prayer and fasting. Throughout Scripture, we see, we see men of God standing in front of the people of God and, and calling them to a fast. At the end of the day, it's your choice. At the end of the day, you have to out answer to God as to whether or not you're going to, to follow. But as your pastor, I'm asking you to join me on this journey. Why? Because I believe he wants to take us to deeper places. And I want us as a community of faith to corporately experience the deep places of God that he has purposed for us to go. I believe that he, he continues to bring to us people day in and day out that walk through these doors. And one of the things that I consistently hear on a regular basis is people who walk in and they may be three sheets to the wind, but they will stand in front of me and they will say there is something different about this place. There is something about coming here that I like. I can I had a drunk man stand in front of me two weeks ago and he was wobbling and wailing back and forth and he looks at me and he says, God is in this place. And it would be so easy to look at him and say, well, you're just drunk. But he recognizes that there is something here. Well, what would it look like if he walked in drunk but walked out sober? What would it look like if we had people who sit here among us on Sunday morning who are sick and infirm and dealing with diseases and the power of God, not because of us, but because we have corporately entered into a place of prayer and fasting, fasting, saying, God, give us more, take us into deeper places. What would it look like for those people? I believe that they would sit here and that they would experience healing, that they would experience deliverance, that they would feel chains break off of their hearts and their lives. You would experience that. That's what he's purposed for us. And it's possible to go deeper. But it's only possible as we're willing to step back and say, I'm willing to push everything away so that I can experience all of you, that I can hunger for you. I'm calling this a church family into a season of fasting. I want you to understand that there are four common types of biblical fasting that we can read about or, or that, that, sp that scripture speaks to. There's a major fast. Major fast is going without food or water for 24 hours or, 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 or more. It's having nothing. That's a major fast. There's a minor fast. In this fast, you choose to abstain from food or food for a certain period of time for part of a day. You, you'll still probably, you'll fast food, but you'll drink liquids during the day. And you might have a small meal at the end of the day. This is often called, talk times called the Jewish fast. The Jewish fast is from sundown to sundown. So it's not necessarily 24 hours, but, but at the end of uh, at sundown, that's when, that's, uh, for a minor fast, you would have a small meal. There's a partial fast. It's giving up certain foods during the course of a fast. This is often referred to as a Daniel fast because in Daniel, early on in the book of Daniel 1, he abstains from certain foods out of his devotion, out of his conviction to God for a certain period of time. That fast typically looks like no meats, no sweets, no breads, or sweet drinks. 
That's what you, the kind of fast that you see Daniel going through. That's a partial fast. There's another type of fast that, while, while biblical fasting most of the time speaks to abstaining from food, there are situations where people cannot go without food. And so they choose to fast from certain things. This is called a soul fast, where they, they sacrifice other things other than food. Maybe it's television or social media or other activities. But they replace those activities in their life with significant times of prayer and seeking God. Now, the fast that I believe God is calling us to is a, is a partial fast or a Daniel fast. This morning when you came in, there are, we, we provided a few resources for you. We'll make these available to you electronically as well if you didn't get one. Uh, if, you, if you're on our email list and we have your contact information, then we'll make sure that you have this. But there are guides that are available to you. One of the ones that we have is a fasting and prayer guide. I've taken a few pages from a much larger document that's been made available online. But in this one, it gives you a little bit of an idea of the same, some of the very same things that I've talked about this morning. What's the origin of a Daniel fast? It sets for you the guidelines. Here's what, you would, here's what you're going to focus on eating and not eating during a Daniel fast. You have a list of foods that you can eat from or that, that, are, that, that go along with a Daniel fast. There are, there are uh, FAQs, frequently asked questions about a Daniel fast that are provided here. And some helpful guidelines, drinking water and those sorts of things. But I've also provided for you this morning, and you got, and, and, and again, we, one of the beautiful things about River Church, and, and, and a lot of this is my doing, is that sometimes we, we get our, our wires crossed. So you got a, you got a prayer, uh, fasting prayer guide this morning that looks like this when you came in. It, most of you got a single page one. If you notice, the dates, he seemed to leave out the 7th through the 14th. Well, we, we've rectified that, and that third page is over on the other side when you leave the day. And so every day there was a scripture, there's a prayer focus. This is something that you can read through. This isn't something that you're obligated to hold to, but, but it can kind of help guide you through the 21 days of fasting. We're going to kick this off on Wednesday, the 2nd of January, and we'll finish on the 22nd. Over the course of the next couple of weeks, we'll provide more resources for, for you. My wife has done a great deal of research on great recipes. We did this last year. It's surprising the things that you can eat. And even for the carnivores, the diehard carnivores in our own family, um, we found some sort. We found some recipes that they actually have lacked. And like, oh, well, we, can, we can do this. Not every day, but we can do this. Here's what I want you to hear. And then this fasting guide, this one here, there's an important, there's an important statement that I, that I want you to hear. Placing your focus on what you can't eat turns the fast into a diet. And I'm not, I'm not calling us to a 21-day diet. I'm not, that's not my job. I'm challenging you, as we leave here today, to go to the Father and say, I need you to show me what this fast needs to look like. I'm setting the bar for a 21-day Daniel fast. But for some of you, he might say to you, look, I want you to actually do a, 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 a 24-hour, no food, no drink fast during this 21 days. And once he, he might select a day for you to do that. Or he might say, here's what I want your fast to look like. I'm asking you to go to him and let him speak to you. But I'm also challenging you to not make it about the food. It has to be about the relationship. It has to be about going deeper with him. It has to be about experiencing more of him than you've experienced in 2018. Because anything less than that will leave you empty, will leave you hungry, will leave you angry, and will leave you spiritually bankrupt. It has to be about going deeper with him. My ultimate hope is that together as a community of faith that we kick off a new year by collectively going to a deeper place where God has called us to go. Will you join me?